Chapter 8 We moved into the new house the week of Thanksgiving. Mom and George were having such a hard time keeping up with all the new bills in this more expensive place. There wasn't any money for Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving passed unnoticed. The new house was small, white with green trim, and set back from the quiet tree-lined street. We were wedged in between two larger houses. It made our house look a little like a doll's house. There was a cherry tree in the front yard next to a wishing well and hedges all along the front. It was really very different living here. It was quiet. There were no neighbors to speak of, no friends, and no people around. The toughest part of living here was the lack of money. There was hardly any food around, and I was hungry all the time. There was no money for books or school supplies. That made a real difference in this new school we went to. Everyone seemed to be from wealthy families. They had everything they needed and more. They looked at me as though I were a rag picker and even called me that sometimes. St. Benedict's in Richmond Hill was in the next town about three miles away. Needless to say, there was no money for bus fares, so Larry and I walked. I hate this school as much as I hated Our Lady of Mercy, Larry said, maybe more. The school is okay. It's the kids I don't like. Yeah, well, I mean the kids. They're all rich and they sure let you know about it. I feel like a beggar in these clothes. We walked in silence. I was pretty much the same as he was. I had socks with holes in them and baggy pants. I had so many knots in my shoelaces I couldn't untie my shoes even if I wanted to. I sat in the back of the room to hide the holes in my socks and the knots in my shoelaces. Some of the kids made fun of my name or my clothes, but most of them just ignored me. I liked that better. I was at St. Benedict's about a week when Miss Keller called me up to the blackboard. Miss Keller was a lay teacher. That meant she wasn't a nun. She was very short and dumpy. She twitched her left eye almost constantly. Anytime she turned her back, all the kids would twitch their faces and blow air into their cheeks to look very fat. Everyone was continually giggling throughout the day. She gave me a problem that involved adding fractions. I had never been taught fractions, so I didn't have the slightest idea even where to start. Excuse me, Miss Keller, I said. What is it now, Birch? I don't know anything at all about fractions. That got a great round of laughter from the kids. Miss Keller paid no attention to me or what I had said. She addressed the class. Now, boys, I want you to see what a really stupid kid looks like. Everyone laughed. This is what's going to happen to you if you don't study and don't pay attention in class. But, Miss Cal- look, Birch, she snapped. You're going to stand at that board until you solve that problem. I don't care <clears throat> how long you have to stand there. Now, boys, let's turn to page 127, she told the class. I stood at the board, looking at the problem. I tried shutting out the giggles and remarks like dummy coming from behind me, but I couldn't. Look at Birch's Catholic socks. Somebody said they're holy. I wanted to disappear. Quiet down, boys, Miss Keller said. There wasn't any way I was going to solve this problem. I thought, I'll just stand here until school is over. Tonight I'll talk to Mom. Maybe she can figure out a way for me to learn fractions. While Larry and I did the dishes, I told him what had happened. Don't ask me about no fractions, he said. I had them and still don't understand them. They're hard. When I'm finished here, I'm going to ask Mom to take me out of school. Are you nuts? She ain't going to take you out of school. She'll say, do the best you can. He did a poor job of mimicking her voice. Well, it don't hurt none to ask. We finished up the dishes and left the kitchen. Mom was in her bedroom reading a magazine. Larry followed me in. I got to talk to you about this new school, I said. Don't tell me you don't like it, because I don't want to hear that. I had a very hard time getting you into that school in the middle of the term. I don't like it. Well, it's too bad. Oh, Mom, I pouted. I don't understand anything they're doing. Well, you'll just have to do the best you can. I told you, Larry quipped. Oh, gosh, I huffed. I stamped my feet as I left the room to show my disappointment. Lift your feet, she called out. I told you so, Larry sneered as we went into our bedroom. I plopped down in the bed. Yeah, you told me. Now, you want to tell me how to solve the problem? I thought you didn't know anything about fractions. 
I mean, now you want me to tell you how to solve the problem? I thought you didn't know anything about fractions. I don't, but that ain't the problem I'm going to help you solve. I don't understand you. I'm going to help you solve the problem of school, period. How? Play hooky. How do you get away with it? Don't the school check? Sure they do. At least in the beginning they did. I just waited around for the mail and took out any letters that came from school. What did the letters say? I don't know. I never read them. I just threw them away. Where do you go every day? I sneak under the turnstile in the subway and go to Manhattan. Alone? There ain't nothing to it. I don't know. I said, maybe I'll ask Walter to help me. Are you kidding? Walter wouldn't help you. He wouldn't help anybody but Walter. I hugged Doggy and tried to fall asleep. I was kind of scared to play hooky. I didn't think I would be able to go into Manhattan all by myself. If I went with Larry and I got lost, oh my gosh. Nah, I'll try to work out something else. The next day, Miss Keller didn't even let me go to my desk. She grabbed a handful in my ear and pushed me toward my spot at the board. I stood there for the entire day. Even through lunch. I wasn't going to eat anyway, but she didn't know that. At day's end, I left the board and the unsolved problem. I left the school. Some of the kids from the class were waiting out front to taunt me. They called me all the same old names like dummy and stupid. I walked away as quickly as I could. One of them threw a rock at me and hit me in the back. I wouldn't flinch or turn back. There were too many of them. I waited up for Walter. I sat at the kitchen table and wrote the problem on a piece of paper for him. He was extra late and I was getting tired. What are you still doing up, he asked as he came through the kitchen door. I was waiting for you. I got a problem. What kind of a problem? Fractions, I said as I handed him the paper. What do you want me to do with this? What? I thought you might help me solve it. What about your teacher? Why don't you ask her to help you? That's what she's there for. I told her I never learned fractions, but she just called me stupid and made fun of me. So if I give you the answer to this problem and she gives you another one tomorrow, what then? Do you want me to go to school for you? Uh, never mind, I said. I just thought you'd help me. I took the paper and left the kitchen. I lay back on the bed without taking my clothes off. A tear ran down the side of my face as I picked up Doggy and hugged him. I sure wish you knew fractions. You'd help me. I fell off to sleep. The next morning, I didn't bother to go to my seat and get my ears pulled. I went straight to the board and stood there. I ran my fingers along the edge of the chalk rail as I had done every day for the past two days. I was getting really bored. What in the hell is going on here? A voice rang out. I turned and saw Walter standing in the doorway. Miss Keller, as well as everyone else in the class, was startled, including me. What the hell do you think you are, lady? He screamed. That's my brother you got standing there. Miss Keller sat at her desk with her mouth wide open. She was speechless. Listen, you stupid bitch. If you can't teach him anything, tell him. We'll find someone who can. I wanted to run from the board and hug him. Where the hell did you get your teaching credentials from? I'll tell you where you got them from. You didn't. Come on, Jennings. He held out his hand for me to come to him. I'll put you into a real school, he said, one where the teachers teach and don't take out their frustrations on the children. He slammed the door as we left the room. I was never so happy to see Walter in all my life. Thank you, I said. I hugged his arm. Don't mention it, he said. He was grinning from ear to ear. I always wanted to do that. Uh-oh, what's Mom going to say? Don't worry about it. I told her last night I was coming here. Really? She wasn't crazy about the idea, but I convinced her of the importance of a good school. I'm going to check out some schools for you myself. I've, I'll find the one you belong in. He did. The following week, Mom enrolled me in St. Michael's in Flushing. It was a long way from the house, seven or eight miles, but Mom said I could get a bus pass. The neighborhood around the school reminded me of the Bronx. There were stores and things, and it wasn't all fancy. It looked ordinary. Mom and I went up the stairs of the school and into the building. We found the principal's office. I'm placing you in Sister Gerard's class, the principal said, grade 4B. Isn't that too high for me, sister? I asked. Sister Gerard is a good teacher, she said. She'll give you all the extra help you need until you can catch up to the others. You'll like her. 
All right, sister, I'll try. Fine, I know you'll do all right. We said goodbye to Mom. The principal showed me which room to go to, and I did. My heart was pounding as I entered my new class. Everyone stopped to look at me. I looked back. Their clothes looked ordinary. I felt better. What's your name? Sister Gerard asked. Jen, uh, Michael, I said. Children, this is Michael. Sit here, will you? She pointed to a seat in the fourth row. I smiled at myself for my quick thinking. I didn't want anyone making fun of my name anymore. I was sure they wouldn't make fun of the name of their own school. Sister Gerard handed out some paper and pencils. We're going to have a spelling quiz. Please put your names on the top of your papers. I panicked. I didn't know how to spell Michael. I knew the first thing to passing a spelling test was to be able to spell your own name. I looked around the room to try to find the name of the school written down somewhere. I spotted it on the front of a boy's notebook. I squinted my eyes to read it. Michael, Sister Gerard scolded. One waits for a question before trying to cheat. I wasn't cheating, sister. I was just uh, looking at that book. Well, keep your eyes on your own paper. Yes, yeah, sister, I mumbled. I was lucky. I had gotten all the letters I needed before she yelled at me. Sister Gerard gave out ten words to spell. I did the best I could, but I was sure it wasn't good enough. She collected the papers. She gave out a reading assignment while she corrected them. The boy next to me let me read on with him. Michael, Sister Gerard called out. I looked around to see who she wanted. The boy next to me poked me in the arm. She wanted me. Michael, she called again. Oh, yes, I stood up. Come here, please. I cautiously approached her. I was sure she was going to yell at me for getting all the words wrong. What's your name? she asked. The redness rushed into my face and neck. Uh, Michael, I mumbled. Well, Michael, spell your name without the apostrophe S, she smiled. She wrote my new name on a piece of paper for me. Welcome to St. Michael's. The principal was right. Sister Gerard was a nice nun, and I did like her. But I was right, too. I got all ten words wrong. Sister Gerard kept me after school every day at the convent for extra work. After the Christmas break, she changed my seat to the front row. I concentrated hard on the extra work and the regular work, too. It didn't leave me time to make any friends, but I didn't mind. For the first time since the second grade at Our Lady of Mercy, I didn't feel so stupid. One day after my lesson, I told Sister Gerard my real name. I knew your real name, Jennings, she said with a smile. You did? Certainly. And if you felt it was important to change it to Michael, well, then that was perfectly all right with me. Besides, she smiled brightly, you couldn't have picked to find her name. That was the first one that came to my mind. Do you know about St. Michael? she asked. No, sister, not too much. Well, he's a very special angel. He's the Prince of Heaven, God's right hand. He slew Lucifer for the Almighty when Lucifer wanted to take over heaven. Wow, I said, he must be strong. He is, he's very strong. Did you visit his statue at our church yet, she asked. No, sister, I haven't. Well, you should, especially now that you've borrowed his name. I think he'd like to meet you, too. He's an archangel, isn't he, sister? Yes, he is. Uh, can archangels be guardian angels? She smiled. Of course they can. I think asking St. Michael to be your guardian angel is a wonderful idea. After the lesson, I went up to the church. I pushed open the heavy front door, and I went in. The smell of burnt candle wax filled my nostrils. I walked up the long, dark aisle to St. Michael's altar. The church was completely empty. The altar candles cast long and strange shadows all about St. Michael's statue. I reached the altar rail and knelt. I strained my neck to look up at his face. He was soft and gentle-looking. He was all dressed in black armor. He had a drawn sword held high above his head. His hair was golden blonde. He looked strong and powerful. Hi, St. Michael, I whispered. Would you be my guardian angel? He didn't answer me. I hope you don't mind my borrowing your name, I said. It's a nice name. Nobody makes fun of it. You know something, St. Michael? I feel awfully lonesome sometimes. 
I love Doggy, and he keeps me company a lot. But I sure wish Jerome were home. I didn't know him very long, just two months, and I really got to like him. Do you think you could let him come home soon, please? I searched through all my pockets for ten cents to light a candle. I could only find four cents. I put it in the box and lit the candle. I owe you six cents, I said. I left the church and headed down the hill to catch my bus. I climbed the steps of the bus and showed the driver my school pass. I sat down across from him and looked out through the front window. You sure look like you got a lot on your mind, the driver said. I looked up and saw the bus driver who drove the bus in the mornings. I smiled. You've been taking my bus every morning for the last few weeks, he said. This is the first time I've ever seen you here in the afternoon. Uh, well, I stayed after school later than usual. Oh, he laughed. You've been a bad boy. No, I laughed too. I always stay after school, but today I stayed even later. You always stay after school and you're not a bad boy? He laughed again. He had such a nice laugh. He sort of boomed it out with his mouth wide open. He had lots of spaces between all his teeth. He was heavy set and had big hands and a big face. Every so often he would lift his cap and brush back the few hairs he had left on top of his head. Then he'd replace his cap. He had dark brown curly hair around the side of his head and in the back. I don't stay after school because I'm bad, I said. I stay because I need to catch up with all the other kids. I got behind. How'd you get behind? Oh, it's a long story. I lived in some homes and missed a lot of school. And then when we moved from the Bronx, I was put in the wrong grade. It got all mixed up. I made a face. I know how that can be, living in homes and missing lots of school. You do? Uh Uh-huh. I grew up in orphanages. You did? Lots of them. In Brooklyn? No, he left in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. You don't like Pennsylvania? Oh, I like Pennsylvania, all right. It's a word we had on a test, and I got it wrong. He left. How many homes did you live in, I asked. Oh, I don't remember. Lots. I, let, I never lived anywhere but homes. You were a lifer. He laughed. Yeah, I guess so. What's your name, son? Jen, uh, Michael. Well, Michael, I'm Sal. Put it there. He stuck out his hand. I shook it. Uh, my real name is Jennings, I said, but the kids always make fun of it. Jennings? Jennings is a nice name. Why do they make fun of it? I don't know. They just do. They haven't made fun of Michael, so I'll keep it. Sal pulled the bus off. Sal pulled the bus up to my stop. I got off. I'll see you tomorrow, Jennings, he smiled. All right, Sal, I'll see you tomorrow. I sat behind or across from Sal every morning after that. Even started seeing him in the afternoons. I stopped in the church after my extra lesson to see St. Michael. And then I waited for Sal's bus. I managed to pay Michael the six cents over a period of a few weeks. How's my son this afternoon, Sal asked as I climbed aboard his bus. I learned to spell three new words today, I told him. Three new words, he shouted. He stopped the bus and turned his head around to me and the other passengers. Did you hear that? He boomed out with pride. My son learned three new words today. Everyone applauded. I was embarrassed, but I liked it. How's your mother and all your brothers, he asked. All right, Larry started going to school again. He hates it. And George, I don't know about George. What's the matter with him? He's drinking a whole lot, more than I ever seen before. I don't know what's wrong with him. Did you ask him? Are you kidding? I can't talk to him. Nobody can. When Mom tries, he gets real mad. How about Walter? He wouldn't talk to him. They hate each other. I didn't mean that. I just meant, how is he? Oh, I don't see him very much. He's always in school. What's he going to be? I don't know. I never asked him. What do you want to be? Uh, nobody had ever asked me that before. Uh, a man, I guess. He laughed. I know you want to be a man, but what kind of work do you want to do? I know you meant that, I said. I don't know. Maybe a bus driver. He laughed loudly. I like Sal. 
I look forward to seeing him every day and talking to him. I began to miss him on weekends when I didn't take the bus. I knew I could talk to Sal about anything. He always listened to me and he always answered my questions. One Saturday afternoon, Larry, Jean, and I were coming home from the movies. We were playing Follow the Leader. Jean, of course, was having a hard time keeping up with us. Larry and I decided to stop and wait for him. While we were waiting, I saw a boy kick a shoebox into the street. I think I'll see what's in the box, I said. Probably nothing. He wouldn't kick it away if there was anything good inside, Larry said. Well, it looks like a good box. I might be able to use it for something. I ran across the roadway to retrieve the box. I shook it and listened. I heard a mew. I quickly opened the box and found a kitten. He couldn't have been more than two or three days old. Hey, Larry, it's a cat. Oh, yeah? He ran over to me. Let me see. I showed him the cat. Boy, he's little, he said. He sure is. I'm going to take him home to show Mom. What about Jean? Wait for him, will you? I didn't give Larry time to answer me. I just dashed off. I ran all the way home. I pushed open the kitchen door. Ma! I hollered. In here, dear. She spoke softly from her bedroom. I poked my head in. Mom was in bed. What's the matter? I don't feel well, dear. Did you like the movie? Oh, yeah. Did Gene behave himself? He went to sleep. What do you think? Where is he? Oh, I almost forgot. I found a pussy cat. I opened the box and showed her the cat. He looks terrible. Where did you find him? He looks okay. No, dear, he doesn't. He needs his mother. Where did you get him? This kid was kicking the box around. He was inside. That's terrible, poor little thing. Mom told me how to feed him with an eyedropper and told me to keep him warm. I was feeding him when Larry and Jean came in. Can I feed him? Jean asked. No. Ma! Jennings won't let me feed the cat, he cried as he ran into her bedroom. What are you going to call him? Larry asked. Well, he's black. I'll call him Midnight. Larry petted Midnight while I tried to feed him. He only needed one finger to pet him. He was so little. Midnight licked off the drop of milk from the end of the eyedropper with his tiny little tongue. I bundled him up in a face cloth and put him back in the box. Mom's going to buy me my own cat, so there, Jean said. He then stuck out his tongue and dashed from the kitchen again. I liked him better when he slept all the time, Larry said. Me too. Larry made soup for all of us, but Mom didn't want any. She said it would just upset her stomach. Should I give some to midnight, I asked. Oh, no, she said. He's a cat. Cats don't eat soup, especially a tiny baby. Can I take him to school Monday to show Sal and Sister Gerard? I think you should see how he is by then. All right, I said. I left her to help Larry with the dishes. We finished up in the kitchen and went into the bedroom. I took midnight with me. Can I sleep with him, Gina? No, he's too little. You'll crush him. No, I won't. I'll sleep light. Then if I fall on him, I won't crush him. That's not what sleep light means, dummy, Larry said. I'm bundled midnight up against Doggy. You'll have to keep him warm. All right, Doggy? I kissed them both and got into bed. Did he answer you? Larry asked. Sure, he said he would. Larry shook his head. This whole place is going nuts. Gene wants to sleep light, so he won't weigh anything, and you talk to stuffed animals, and they answer you. I awoke early Sunday morning. Rain was falling hard against the window. I laid my head back against the pillow when I remembered midnight. I jumped out of bed and went over to the chair where he and Doggy were sleeping. I pushed back the face cloth and lifted him up. Good morning, little midnight, I said. I kissed his fur. I turned him in my hands so that I could see his little face. His eyes were closed and his body was limp. He was dead. Oh, gosh, no, I cried. I kissed him a whole bunch of times. Please don't be dead. Oh, please don't be dead. What's the matter? Larry asked. Midnight's dead. I cried. The whole house was in disorder. Larry and Jean and I were crying. Mom got up from her bed even though she was sick to settle everyone down. She fixed a small box by lining it with a handkerchief. She told us to bury Midnight in the front yard. Larry and I made a cross for the top of Midnight's grave. 
We got Gene's shovel from his pail and shovel set, and we went into the yard. I let Gene hold Doggy. We dug the grave and put Midnight in. We covered him over and set the cross in the ground. I couldn't believe my love for him didn't keep him alive. I would have taken good care of him. The tears on my face were mixed with the heavy, heavily falling rain. But it didn't matter. I don't think it mattered to Larry or Gene either. We were all very upset. Inside, I lay down with Doggy in my arms. He was dripping wet, but I didn't care. I fell asleep feeling very helpless. You look like you lost your best friend, Sal said to me the next morning. I did, I mumbled. Why, son, what happened? I sat behind Sal and told him all about midnight. You know, son, just loving something or someone like midnight isn't enough. He was neglected and mistreated long before you found him. By then it was too late. But I really loved him, Sal, my eyes filled. I know you did, but it was too late. All the love in the world wouldn't have saved him. So I know it's kind of like how I feel about staying in this YWCA hell for six more months before I'm allowed to move to some more normal, normal people, normal community. And I'm saying, hmm. I know you did, but it was too late. All the love in the world wouldn't have saved him. I sat in silence as the bus rumbled down Main Street. Before he died, he knew you were his friend. Do you think so? Of course he did. And isn't all that really matters now? Isn't that all that really matters now? The fact that he knew you loved him and he knew you were his friend? Sal made me feel a little better. Before I left his bus, he gave me a big hug. I'll see you tonight, he said, and cheer up, he smiled. I got off the bus and thanked him for talking to me. He winked and closed the door. He drove off. I walked up the hill thinking about all the things Sal had said to me. When I reached school, I went straight to class. I didn't feel much like standing around in the schoolyard. Sister Gerard was at her desk. Well, you're here early, she said. Yes, sister. Don't you feel well? Yes, sister, I said. I feel all right. I mean, I'm not sick or anything like that. I just feel a little sad because my cat died. Oh, that's terrible, she said. She stood up and put her arms around me. I cried into her. She didn't call on me all morning or afternoon. I think she knew my mind was wandering from time to time, and she didn't want to embarrass me. Sister Gerard was like that. She was kind. Late in the afternoon, a boy came into the room from one of the other classes. He handed Sister Gerard a note. Continue to read to yourself, she told everyone in the class. Michael, she called. I looked up to see if she wanted me. She did. Will you take this note down to Sister Regina for me, please? She handed me a folded piece of paper. Sure, Sister. Should I wait for an answer? Yes, please. She smiled. I left the room and went down to the principal's office. Sister Regina was in her office, talking to a gray-haired man in a dark overcoat. I waited outside. Jennings, she called from her office. Yes, Sister, I have a note for you, I said. As I walked in, I was a little surprised she remembered my real name, but then she was the principal and always seemed to know everything. Sit down, will you, Jennings? This is Mr. Frazier. Hello, sir, I said. I sat down. Jennings, she said, your mother was rushed to the hospital with pneumonia. Oh, no. I didn't want to hear what was coming next. I'm sorry, son, Mr. Frazier said. Mr. Frazier has agreed to let you stay with him until your mother is better. Is that all right? I didn't answer her. I was thinking about mom and going away again. Maybe if she hadn't gotten up to help us with midnight. Oh gosh. Jennings, she said. I raised my head just a little. I didn't want the tears I was fighting off to fall. If you stay with Mr. Frazier, she said, you won't have to disrupt your schooling. You can continue with us without any interruptions. Uh, uh, yes, sister, all right. I couldn't believe I was going away again. For some reason, I just sort of put going away out of my mind and forgot about it. That was a mistake. I should never do that again, I thought. Oh, gosh. I don't even have doggy with me. What am I going to do? I lost the battle with my tears. They fell all over the back of my hand. I buried my face in my hands. Sister Regina put her arms around me and hugged me. 
Oh gosh, first little midnight and now mom. Why?